Well, last week we talked about Chris's uh, video and podcast uh, that was about the two funds for life. And uh, for those of you who missed it, I hope you'll go to the Two Funds for Life page under Boot Camp and, uh, and, 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 and catch that video. And if you haven't heard, seen his video as well as the video we did last week, they're both worth your while if you're interested in the Two Funds for Life strategy. But this week, we're going to focus on uh, the best-in-class portfolio and the ETFs that uh, Chris spends a lot of effort putting together for the folks who follow our work. And, uh, and again, he has done a video. If, uh, if you look under boot camp, well, in fact, if you look in the notes underneath this, this particular podcast or video, however you're experiencing this, you'll see a link there. But I, if you're interested, I hope you'll dig deep there. But this is kind of a Q&A session uh, on the best in class uh, selection that Chris does with ETFs. And Chris, uh, by the way, thank you as always for doing all this hard work. It's a it's a big effort, and um, and I I think it would be helpful for those who might be with us for the first time on this topic to spend a couple of minutes going through. I've got an article right here in my hand, choosing best in class ETFs. This was actually from the October two thousand nineteen. Uh, uh, American Association of Individual Investors publication. And we'll have a link to that uh, in, in the notes. And in a minute, I'll tell you why that was such a an interesting date for this article to come out. But in there, Chris, you have the six basic steps that that you go through to decide in each asset class, big, small, value, blend, U.S. international, REITs, emerging markets, which of the ETFs you think is positioned to have among the best return in the future? It's uh, who knows what the future will bring over the next five or 10 years. But the idea here is, in fact, I think that uh, that goal that you have is something you should share. In fact, why don't you start by sharing the goal that you have in picking these so folks understand really what you're looking for? The the goal is really just to do the best for our investors to help position them for the highest expected return. And as you point out, nobody knows the future. We don't have a crystal ball. There, um, the the ability to predict the future, even even for the best in class academic prediction tool, which is probably looking at valuations, uh, it, it can be wrong for a decade. Uh, so uh, it, it's I, I'm not trying to pick the funds that are going to make me look good in a year or make our investors the most money in a year or a month or a day or even five years. I'm trying to pick the funds that are going to help them be buy and hold investors with the highest expected return in these asset classes that we recommend as part of our portfolios over more than a decade over multiple decades. Uh, and and so there will be a time when I'm wrong for a very long time. And I'm, I'm ready to accept that. And that's part of the reason I'm very upfront and open with my process, because I want people to understand that uh, this isn't a lot of judgment on my part. It's not a lot of guessing on my part. Uh, it's a very objective numerical process, and they can check my work. <laughs> you can you can go and do this on your own if you want, and uh, you you might even find a fund that doesn't fit the category that that has great um, attributes that fit the strategy that you choose that that you want to follow because uh you know you've you've done additional work and research that that's possible i i have to find funds that fit these categories and kind of fit the labels and have the attributes that we're looking for and 
the the gist of the science behind it is um, is founded in the work of Fama and French, these Nobel Prize winning uh, academics, as well as many who have come after them, who basically looked back over the asset returns in the past and said, "Do we see any patterns? You know, were there certain kinds of uh, equities?" Uh, they've done this work for bonds as well, but were there certain kind of equities that delivered a higher return in the long run? Maybe not in the short run, maybe not in every year or every five years, but over the long run. And typically they had more volatility, not surprising. You take more risk, you would expect a higher return. Uh, and what were the attributes of those equities that delivered that? And those attributes, uh, the the most famous ones, the ones that were first discovered, were first of all the 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 market risk, the idea that equities outperform bonds. Um, the second one, the second and third were size and value, and you can see that we've built our portfolios around tilting towards size and value. Uh, and then there are some other attributes as well, uh, like quality. And that's one that a lot of people filter on. Momentum, that's another one that people filter on. So uh, what we really want to do is find the funds that give us exposure to these attributes that have a history of de delivering not just like a half a percent more, but typically, you know, one to five percent more for the equities that were in that class. And so when you start to think about each one of these attributes or factors, as the academics call them, being worth one to 5%, if I can get another 10% exposure to one of those, that's worth a lot. Mm -hmm. And if I have two funds that both call themselves small cap value, and one gives me 10% exposure to small and 10% exposure to value, and another one that gives me 30% exposure to small and 30% exposure to value, you can see where maybe it would be worth paying more, a little bit more to get the one that has that additional exposure. And that's that's really the gist of uh, of what we're trying to do. Um, did, did you want me to go through the six steps now? Yeah, or Could you briefly go through them? I think that would be helpful, Chris. For sure. First this, is, this is covered in um, the article that we published in the October 2019 uh, AAII journal. So it's been out there a while. And as Paul and I were talking about it this morning, we pointed out that this was before the DFA ETFs were available or the Avantis ETFs were available. So think of it as... Uh, you know, the dark ages, <laughs> we didn't have some of the best candidates uh, in terms of these exposures to factors available in the ETF wrapper that we do today. And that's why they're not mentioned in the article. But the process is pretty much unchanged. I've used the same process for years. And it follows these six steps. And they rely on use of the portfolio visualizer tools. Portfolio visualizer has uh, a um, a page for looking at all of the ETFs or mutual funds at once by region. If you want, you can look at U.S., international, emerging markets, and it shows you the historical exposure that these funds have had to these different attributes, and you can download that information if you want. So the first step is to go and find the funds that have uh, meaningful exposure for each of these asset classes. You know, what are the funds that are in the emerging markets area that have, first of all, exposure to market? Uh, second of all, I want them to be funds that have uh, a high, it's called R squared. But what that means is that there's no wizard behind the curtain who's second guessing and changing the portfolio of the all, all the time. I want a portfolio that's stable and can be modeled using these principles. So you can look back and explain its returns with a high degree of confidence. So now, Chris, if I could just interject there. When you say stable, are you talking about stable stability in 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 terms of the commitment to the asset class or to the individual companies within the asset class to the asset class okay. because 
Companies may change over time. They may fall in and out of favor and be value at one point in time and then growth at another point in time. Uh, they may also grow in size. And so what we're looking for is a fund that doesn't, you know, one month look like a growth fund and then another month look like a, a value fund uh, or, or vary in its geographic exposure. I, I want a fund that, uh, you know, has... I'm looking for something that does what it says on the tin, so to speak, right? I, I want something that tells me it's going to be small gap value and it actually is. And it gives, you know, it gives me the ingredients I'm looking for and it does so consistently over time. And the R squared value, which is part of this analysis, tells you that. It, it tells you if the fund is vacillating hither and yon or if it is stable. And so that's a piece of the selection criteria. Um, and then, you know, once I have found these candidate funds, I can download the information that tells me how much exposure there was to each of these attributes. And then I can analyze. So that's step two is to download the information. And you can do this. You can export it in, in an Excel spreadsheet and play with it all you like. It's it's kind of fun for the geeky nerds in the audience or the, the people who like numbers and Excel. I, it, but then the next step is to go and find the factor premiums and what they've been worth and figure out if I get 30% exposure to a factor that's worth 1%, well, that'd be about a third of a percent per year expected return. But if I get 30% exposure to a factor that's been worth 5%, well, then that's worth 1.5% per year. So, so you need to get those factor statistics and multiply them times the exposures that each of these funds has to the attributes. And based on that, you can add that up um, and you can subtract out an expense ratio or, or you can use the alpha that they've calculated. You got, I do it both ways just to cross check my work. Um, to get an expected return. And then you can look at the different funds and see how they stack up, which one has the highest expected return. Now, I, I go beyond that a little bit by also uh, running a Morningstar X-ray and looking at, at uh, other attributes of the fund. I look at you know how liquid it is, what the bid ask spread is, uh, what its assets under management are, the price to earnings, uh, price to uh, or price to book of the companies, um, the number of companies in the portfolio. So I, I look at a lot of different things, and I, I I'll just take one of those as an example. Let's say I found a fund that had a very high expected return, but it had a one one and a half percent expense ratio. I would not recommend that fund. I would I would just say you know you're paying you're paying too much, even if they have a a, a brief or long history of outperformance, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't go there because I don't believe it's worth it. I don't I don't believe philosophically that it's worth paying one and a half percent for what should be something that's managed systematically uh, and and should come from other sources. And uh, so it's uh, there's a little bit of art in it, but the the core piece of it, the beginning of it, and and the thing that does tie breaking most of the time, is this analytical. Just it's a math problem. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you you do this basically once every two years. Yes, uh, and and adjusting the recommendations. Uh, what does it take to make a, a change? I know. I know we're concerned about the tax implications of of giving people a better uh, what we think is a better long-term investment so th they're forced to kind of consider the taxes and how much extra would I make or how many years would it take to make up for the taxes uh, that I might pay but but um uh, give us a little thought on wrestling with making a new recommendation well, first of all, it takes some history. Uh, it, it, I need to have some data. It's not enough. So, for example, people have asked about um, uh, Avantis's new fund, AVDS, that's only been around since August of last year. I can run a regression on the data that I've got, and I get no numerical, no statistical significance in the numbers. I, I, I don't have enough data there yet. 
Uh, so a little bit of history helps. Uh, the second thing I need is uh, some reasonable amount of assets under management and bid ask spread. So a brand new fund that only has 50 million in assets under management and uh, let's say, you know, a, a half a percent bid ask spread, I'm going to be reluctant to recommend that because I don't want people to have to be too fancy in their trading to get a fair price. Uh, or or find they have trouble trading it uh, from a liquidity standpoint. Um, so th those are two of the, the things that I need. But let's say I have a brand new fund and it shows up and, uh, and by brand new, I mean, it's long enough. I've got the history. So maybe it's a year or two old and I've analyzed it versus our existing recommendation and it comes out 0.01% better. I'm not going to switch my recommendation because that's just not statistically meaningful. Mm -hmm. But if it came out half a percent better mm -hmm. and I felt like it was reaching significant uh, tradability and uh, and availability and I trusted the company, then yeah, I would I would probably change my recommendation. So it 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 does need to overcome a threshold. It's not just, you know, that it wins by 0.01% or something. And in fact, in the future, I would like in the next iteration of the best in class ETFs, I'd like to figure out a way to show size of the difference mm -hmm. to show that some of these funds are multiple beasts of the same character. They're not that different. And in some categories, the differences are substantial. Yeah. And I, I haven't yet figured out how to do that, but I, I want to figure out a way to do it without making it too complicated. And and since they can be substantial and and the to the ends of the spectrum the s p 500 when you're in an s p 500 etf or mutual fund the difference in return is likely only to be the expense ratio or or it will be a very minor difference on the other hand in your article you focused on small cap value and there the returns can be huge uh, year to year. And, and, and we get that question all the time. Is it worth another, another 10 basis points expense ratio to be in the Avanta small cap value? And uh, as I was getting prepared for this, I thought it will be kind of fun to compare uh, the top of the, of the list uh, in that article was VBR, the Vanguard uh, small cap value uh, ETF. And uh, so I looked at the returns year by year uh, for 1920, 21, 22, and 23 uh, as the Avantis came out just about the time this article came out. And, um, and the difference on average per year was 6.5%. And, uh, and that included a bad year. I mean, it was not only better in the good years, it was better in the bad years. And I, and I think, by the way, there was a reason uh, for that uh, in, the, in their focus on, uh, uh, on quality uh, compared to, to the, other, uh, the other ETF. But 6.5%. Now, th that is not something we would expect over a long period of time. But when you're worried about 20 basis points or 10 basis points on the expense ratio, uh, that, that is a, a, an interesting, a pretty easy decision if you believe the numbers. But as you look at what you know about the small cap value uh, ETF at Avantis, while you would not have expected 6.5% difference, when you look at how it is constructed would it have surprised you or would you have expected a potentially a 1% difference per year? It's an interesting question. Let's uh, let me just get some data before I answer it. Uh, so uh, let's, you were talking about VBR versus AV. Uh, AV UV. UV. Yep. Yeah. So if I, if I go and I look at the factor exposures there, uh, they both are, AVUV has a little bit more market exposure uh, than 
the VBR. So that that actually might be worth a quarter of a percent or a tenth of a percent, something like that. But but no, size. No, would you say now that was market exposure? Yeah, market exposure. So that that could be due, for example, VBR is less than one, and AVUV is a little more than one. That could be due to either leverage or cash drag. You know, just as examples, right? If you have a cash drag, that would lower your market exposure. Got it. If you have some leverage, you might be able to increase your market exposure. And then you look at the exposure to size, and you have a 0.5. Uh, 0.54 or 54 percent exposure to size in VBR versus 82, uh, 0.82 or 82 percent of AVUV, and value it's 0.61 versus 0.44. But then you also have rich minus weak, where you're getting 0.09 versus 0.23. So, what 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 rich versus weak? Uh, robust minus weak. Yeah. Robust minus weak, which is a profitability factor or quality Uh factor. Yeah. Yeah. But then you also have this annual alpha um, of minus two for VBR and positive 2.3 for AVUV. Uh, Now, alpha can be due to expense ratio, but we would expect it to go the opposite direction here. So, it begs the question, why would VBR have this negative 2% per year and AVUV have this positive 2% per year? I'm going to go out on the limb and say that part of it may be um, the fact that VBR is a an index fund in the traditional sense in that it follows a public publicly published index. And that opens... That opens you to the possibility of people front running trades, yeah. of going out and getting in front of some some rebalancing that needs to be done by the fund uh, and making it so the fund, if it's particularly large, ends up buying and selling at a disadvantage when they recon- do the reconstitution. Yeah. This is one of the areas where Avantis though not strictly an index fund because it uses a private index that's not publicly published, they would have a systematic advantage because they don't have to tell anybody they're going to go trade a bunch of stuff. They get to just know among themselves internally that systematically these stocks fell out of our screening criteria and these stocks have come into our screening criteria and we're going to go trade. And nobody knows Nobody sees, nobody, nobody can anticipate it. So this is one of those areas where I, I get upset when I hear people get overly religious about, you know, thou shalt only use index funds and they must be labeled as such because there's actually a disadvantage to that formal label in that you can, you can end up losing money because you're doing everything so publicly and openly that other people can take advantage of you. Um, and, and I'm very confident because of the high R squared values that both of these funds are being systematically managed. They're both like 98%, which means that, that these exposure to the factors can explain 98% of the performance historically. Uh, and so I feel like they're both being managed systematically. It's just one's doing it publicly in the open and the other one's not. So based on these changes, I wouldn't have expected a 6% difference without taking into account the alpha. Um, and uh, I, I write it off at least partly to good luck. You know, I think yeah. it's been good luck that, uh, that that 6% has accrued to Avantis. And I hope it continues, <laughs> but uh, I, I wouldn't guarantee it. Yeah. And I, I actually uh, asked uh, one of the research uh, folks at Avantis about the kind of a market that Avantis small cap value would not be amongst a better performer. Interesting. And uh, they had they had three kinds of markets, but they were periods. In one case, it was the the, the period when everybody liked small. Doesn't matter what it is, they like small, and there are periods that that happens, and uh, and and also the periods when the smallest, the smallest of the small become 
uh, a big deal. It's a very speculative kind of of uh, typical kind of a, a rush to to chase performance at the end of a bull market kind of a uh, of an of an event. But uh, there are periods uh, that uh, they do not expect to be amongst the best performers. But but with the market if giving value to the quality of the portfolios, giving value to the to the low PE ratio, uh, that the odds are in their favor. Now, that's what everybody everybody in the business has a reason why they do what they do and can defend it, which is one of the frustrating parts of advice that people get. When it comes to investing, but I interrupted you in your in your six steps. Why don't you, I'm sorry. Let's go back to uh, whatever step you were on, like four. I know. I think we'd actually gotten through most of them, so I'll just oh, recap. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, okay. the first one is select the candidate funds for each of the asset classes. The second is collect the basic fund attributes from uh, ETF.com, Morningstar, and uh, and then the third was analyze the historical fund factor exposures using the data from PortfolioVisualizer.com. And the fourth is estimate expected fund returns based on the historical premiums. We talked about that. And then the fifth is select the best in class funds for each for uh, each of the asset classes. And the sixth is go back and run a Morningstar X-ray of the total portfolios that result and see if the portfolio um you, you know, does better than the old portfolio, meaning that, it, you know, ideally I'd like them to be just as small and just as value tilted and ha still have a low expense ratio. Uh, but the Morningstar X-ray also tells me things like uh, what's the yield of the total portfolio and uh, and what's the expense ratio of the to total portfolio. Interestingly, since I wrote this article, we now have the portfolio configurator on the website where once I update the recommendations, you can see those same kinds of data, at least for the date when I updated it, you can see the what the yields were between different choices of fund families or different portfolios and what the expense ratios were between them. So uh, it's not necessarily up to date when you use it, but it is uh, as a comparison tool, I think it's useful because some people are just, totally passionate about keeping their expenses low and they can go in and see, well, if I go all Vanguard, I can keep my expenses low, but maybe my portfolio is a little bit bigger. Maybe it's a little less value-y. And you could even go in and compensate and say, instead of, instead of the ultimate buy and hold, for example, maybe I'm gonna switch and, uh, and do something that is all value to compensate for the fact that I've got lower expense ratio and less of a value tilt in the ultimate buy and hold using Vanguard. Well, if I go all value, I can bring some of that back, you know, or maybe you tilt a little more towards small in value. Yeah. When you use the word tilt, uh, I know when I first came upon that term and as it relates to these, these portfolios, uh, uh, tilting, uh, as I understand it, is simply putting more small cap value in a portfolio than would be represented by the total market. Uh, by a cap, on a cap, by a cap weighted. weighted total market yeah. index. That's exactly right. And 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 so because you're tilting, it, it you really need to understand the implications of what it does to your risk. I guess. I mean, that would be the the, the main thing we'd want to know. We we do expect to get some premium for having taken uh, this this additional risk. But is there any better way uh, than to look at what it does to the worst periods to judge that that risk for investors? But that's what we try to do with that with that fine tuning table that compares small cap value to the S&P 500 in 10% increments, where you can see as you change the tilting that it does something to the return and it does something to the risk. And that's what you're likely to be signing up for. Uh, is there anything more that a person can do to figure out what this tilting really means? I, I think there are 
two risks we take on when we tilt, when we invest disproportionately in a part of the market, any part of the market. Um, one of those is this, uh, as you point out, if we're investing in small cap value, we're taking on more volatility. Uh, the interesting thing there is that when you combine the S&P 500 and small cap value, you get more of a boost in return than you get a boost in in volatility because they aren't perfectly correlated. They they don't always zig and zag at the same time. And so the fact that now they're they're not singing in unison, so to speak, right? There's a little dissonance there that that's smoothing the ride a little bit for the added return that you get. And yes, the finding tuning tables are a great place to see that, but there's a whole nother piece and we do talk about this and that's tracking error. As -hmm. soon as you decide to be different, you're not going to get the same ride and experience you hear about on the radio or on the news or from your neighbor. And sometimes that's going to be good. And sometimes that's going to be bad. And when it's bad, if you stay the course, eventually it will probably be good. That's why we recommend it. But if you bail when it's bad because you're different and you feel like you're missing out, then you lose all of the benefit of being different and you would have been better off just being the same from the beginning. And I think that's that's where the wisdom of uh, Buffett and Bogle's advice comes from, is this idea that 90 plus percent of people will never take the time to learn why they should be different to to the degree they need to, to do it with conviction. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons I expect and hope that our audience is engaged for the long term, because in some respects, we're, we're really trying to go deep. We're trying to help them develop a, a, an understanding of a principle that is kind of it's hopefully going to be their secret weapon. Um, when you look at it, one of the reasons why the small in value attributes of the market or or the small in value premiums haven't gone away, even though they should be arbitraged, is that institutional investors can't invest with the patients that private investors can, that individual investors can. This is your secret weapon. This is your superpower, right? You can, you can go for five years with some tracking error being different from the market and yet not outperforming and stay the course. An institutional investment manager is probably going to get hammered if he does that. And so it's hard for them to exercise this same, the same muscle, the same superpower. But if you can learn it and you can make it yours and you can invest with that conviction for five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, uh, you have the ability to beat the pro uh, because you're your own manager. You're not you're not uh, at the whims of somebody else who's looking over your shoulder saying, wait a minute, you underperformed last year. <laughs> and that really does happen. It's interesting that generally within the institutional market, if you underperform in your category, I mean, they're, they are looking at the, the same asset class, but if you underperform for three years, they're going to find somebody who had a good performance the last three years, the part that is so remarkable, and I'm sure must be known uh, by people that are working on these institutional accounts, the trustees and and such, that that, uh, the performance the following three years is generally better than the new funds you brought on because you saw them perform well the last three years while yours weren't performing well, but they did if you had just held on. Yeah, stay the course. Uh, by the way, I, I did an interesting little study here uh, because there's another purpose for your work. And I forgot to ask, how many hours would you guess you put into the process of going through all of the of the ETFs that qualify in each one of the asset classes, when you do this next next year, again, how many hours will it take you? Uh, I would I would guess to 
one to two full-time weeks. So 40 to 80 hours, something like that. Uh, Because although it's systematic and it doesn't seem like it should take that long, I, 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 I look at it multiple ways. I double check my work. I, um, I go back over all of the communications I've received from people about potential new funds that should be in the consideration set. Um, and then there's preparing the material to communicate the conclusions once you've, you've drawn them and, and then there's uh, recording some podcasts to share it as well. So yeah, I, I would guess it's at least a couple of weeks, a couple of man weeks and um, it, it's fun and it's interesting, but it, often comes at Christmas time. (laughs) (laughs) So if I don't get it done till the end of January, you know why it's because I enjoyed my Christmas. Well, we sure appreciate you doing it, Chris. So here's another use for your work. I recently uh, had a, um, a conversation that was set up by a fellow who has a podcast and he asked JL Collins if, and myself, if we'd like to have a conversation and to meet. And so we actually, we met online and we had a conversation and, uh, and, and David was the, the moderator, but it turned out David didn't have much to do because we had lots to talk about. What a, what a fun guy he is and, and, uh, fascinating what he's done to help people. Um, but he is a great fan of the total market index and go so far as to say that you could do all of your equity saving with just one fund. And that would be uh, the Vanguard total market index. Uh, And that could be an ETF. That could be a mutual fund. They both look virtually the same. In fact, I think they are actually legally have the same uh, portfolio. Um, but here's the question that I would have to ask. I could totally agree with him on, I don't mean that I would do that myself, but I could see why he can make the recommendation. It looks like the market, there'll be no surprises, and maybe you're likely more likely to stay the course. And of course, we're trying to make the case for adding some other asset classes. But if you were not going to add other asset classes, one could at least take a look at what you recommend in that position on all of those different asset classes, the large cap blend, which is what the total market index is, uh, is a VTI, uh, is the one that he would be having people buy. And yet, when I look at your recommendation, uh, AVUS, these are very different holdings in terms of the factors. And uh, for for example, uh, and, and by the way, AVUS is kind of a total market index built with the biases that the people, the, the academic people who uh, are behind uh, Avantis, uh, they look at how you'd want to position yourself for the long term in what you might consider a total market index. So the uh, average size, uh, well, let's start with how many companies in the portfolio. AVUS has 2,300 and uh, VTI is 3,700. And I don't know if there is would be an expectation of much difference in the return because both of those are hugely Diversified. I think academics say you need to have a hundred companies in an asset class to eliminate the risk of of, of company loss, one company failing. Uh, but I looked at the size, and the average size company in VTI is 169 billion, and AVUS is 82 billion. So they are about half the size. That would give a little bit of an advantage, wouldn't it, Chris? It would, yeah. And and in fact, when you run the the factor regressions on size, what you see is 
that, well, VTI, since it's the total market, is essentially zero, zero exposure to any factor other than the market. And the AVUS gives you roughly 10% of the size exposure okay. of the size factor. And the size factor. Um, so the size factor on the model I use has been historically about 2%. So if you get 10% or 2%, that's worth 0.2%. Well, so then you look at exposure to value. VTI is 22% value, and the AVUS is 31% value. So I'm thinking there's a good hit there as well. I mean, a good advantage. And and again, we can look at the, the factor exposure, and AVUS has given you about 16% exposure versus... 0 0.03, which is again, essentially zero. Let's call it 0.13%. The value factor, that's been worth 2.9%, 2.88%. So I, I looked at the last four and a half years because that's when AVUS was available and I compared it uh, at Morningstar and the compound rate of return for AVUS was 12.96% and for VTI, 12.17. Which now, is about what these say you would expect. Yeah, you'd get another half a percent-ish. Yeah. So so my feeling, I'm always looking for a half a percent. So it, it, it says to me that uh, maybe I, we need to do an article uh, J.L. Collins versus Merriman and, and, and Pedersen and, uh, and, and, and actually show that that's something that one as an investor, uh, what would you say the probability is? How would you measure the probability? Is there an easy way to do it or off the uh, top that's of your head? Well, I... Yeah, I'd have to think about that and see if there's a way to I say mean, what the prob what the probability of those small tilts showing up in one year, five year, ten years. Twenty. Twenty years from everything I can remember was the period that it always did better. Historically, over the sample we have, but yeah. you wouldn't and Larry Swedro likes to point this out, you really would never expect it to go to 100%. You would never expect a risk factor to deliver its premium over 100% of the any time horizon because then it's not a risk factor. Then it's a guaranteed factor. Um, right. So there should always be some risk of under or it's part of a sales pitch. It's really just that we don't we don't have a long enough history yeah. to see yeah. the, all bad, of the these. worst time. Yeah. All of these long tails. Yeah. But you would expect that with every passing year, the odds of underperformance goes down because uh, you're diversifying uh, by taking on these different attributes. And the more you have exposure to, the more consistent the performance you would expect to get. And and also in my little study, I looked at the S and P five hundred V O O, and uh, I found it interesting. It it compounded at twelve point eight two. Now that's quite an advantage over VTI. Over the last ninety six years, it's been a one tenth of one percent difference, uh, according to the academic studies. The S and P five hundred uh, versus the total market uh, index. So anyway, I, I think that's an interesting way to use your work. It doesn't have to be to, to build one of our portfolios. A person could use your work to, to give them some ideas on how they could build their own personal asset allocation. And, uh, well, and, and they, you've, you've indirectly brought up here as we went through these different examples, an important point, and that's that, the farther you get away from 
the total market or the S and P five hundred, the more likely there's a a difference between the returns that you could get with different fund constructions, and that's one of the reasons that small cap value has this higher expected boost in your portfolio performance is that it's the, there's a lot of variation in small companies. There's thousands of small companies and there's a lot of uh, room for, for variety. When you, when you're looking at the big companies and you've only got five or 600 to choose from and everybody on the planet is analyzing them to death you yeah. don't expect that there's going to be, be much dispersion or or uh, or range of returns to be had, and so that's why um, that's why there's not as much difference in the fund choices for S and P five hundred or total market or up in that category. But there's quite a bit of difference uh, in small cap value, and there's quite a bit of difference in international funds and in emerging markets funds. And if you really want to go to the extremes, the emerging market's small in value. But it, it, there we run into a different problem, and that's just there aren't very many. There, are, there aren't very many to choose from. Yeah. And uh, so small cap value, to me, really hits this sweet spot where there's a lot of choice in the number, in the number of funds and providers there uh and uh a lot of variety in the returns to be had so there's it's it's the rich spot it's the the place where i think the greatest opportunity is i think that we've probably given people enough information for one day we do have more questions on best in class but there is one that i think is really interesting and that is and it's a it's a great question when you think of small companies the reason that we are we are uh, interested in small companies emotionally is we see the possibility to the upside. Any one of them, if they could invent something that's really special, uh, could you could have a not a 10 bagger, you could have a thousand banger or a hundred banger. Uh, uh, and, and and so and and so that's the view of small. And yet when these small cap value funds are building a portfolio they are not intending to own microsoft from the day it goes public and and until today because it is going to to well it may never be a small cap value although i think at one point it came back down in 2000 to to qualify to be a large cap value company it had fallen so much but the, the the question is, how does a small cap value fund deal with the company getting bigger? And then after I had a conversation with the people at Advantis about this, and I wish you had been able to be there, you were out traveling the world, uh, what they talk about is the company gets up to the mid cap, right there at the line where it's going to go from small cap to mid cap. And so they can't just sell it then because if it falls back down the next day into small cap, then it's supposed to be in a, the small cap fund. So they have a formula they use. Everything is systematic uh, there. They have a formula that that when it goes through, it has to go through enough that it protects. It, it really is a move out of small cap to mid cap. But then they still have a systematic way and I believe this is true at DFA as well of using momentum and 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 letting the uh, a company continue and watching it. And when it loses its uh, momentum, uh, and they show me some great examples uh, of some well-known companies, by the way, uh, of where they use this 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 strategy. So they are not there with the small company forever. They did, by the way, <clears throat> participate in the. GameStop, as so did DFA, and DFA claimed to sell at over three hundred. the The formula at uh, at at uh, Avadis got them out at about one fifty, uh, and so it still worked. <laughs> but but they, of course, in hindsight, you always know what you should have done in hindsight. But that is the thing about small blend, small value. 
you're not going to have the big run of a stock forever, uh, like a Nvidia or uh, Google or any any of these of these stocks that are in the the big seven. What, what is the term for the big seven? Uh, I don't know right now. <laughs> you're the one I thought would know that one. The, anyway, the that's fan- I mean, there, for a while there, there were FANG stocks, but that doesn't include yeah. NVIDIA, I don't think. That was Netflix yeah. for the end, but NVIDIA probably belongs in there more than Netflix now. Yeah, yeah. they certainly do now. It, uh, so, it, did you have more on that, Paul? Because we did have no, a question I did, related. Do you have a comment on that, too? Well, we had a question um, that came in. Oh, I've got it. Too. I think it's number four here. Chris, I appreciate all the work you and the Merriman team have done over the years. I became a fan of the podcast a few years ago, and I've learned a lot. One question I that I have that I can't quite get my head around concerns, what happens when a value stock fund, for example, AVUV, oh, becomes popular and attracts a lot of investors? I guess, is that the one you're talking about? Yeah, doesn't the increased demand for the stocks the fund holds drive up their prices, resulting in those stocks no longer consider being considered value and thus undermining the original investment th- thesis? And the same thing would be true about size, right? It's, you know, now they're going to have market caps that are bigger. And the you kind of touched on this in your discussion about momentum eventually they'll they'll leave the fund because they get too big the way these funds define their selection set is as a percentile of the market so if all of the stocks that are in a fund become overvalued there'll be other ones that are undervalued and there will be other stocks that are small so there will always be a bottom 10 percentile, 20 percentile to the market. Um, The other piece that goes along with this is as successful as AVUV has been, I think they have 11 billion in assets under management now. It's still a tiny part of the market. So uh, it's it's not, uh, I, I don't think they're running out of space, but it does happen. You know, it does happen that funds Vanguard runs into this issue at times. You know, it it does happen that you end up with a fund that is kind of too big for its category. And um, often that leads to the creation of a new fund that that can occupy that space while that that fund is no longer as small and no longer as valuey. But I don't think Avantis is there yet. You know, what is interesting to me uh, is how low the turnover is uh, at Avantis small cap value. I believe if I I want to say eight uh, percent, but whatever it's a low number. And one of the one of the Vanguard small cap value uh, ETFs is forty five percent, which is what which was shocking. I was actually shocked about both of them because I just figured that uh, Avantis with their strategy, and by the way, short-term trades do not have a, the same tax impact in an ETF that they right. do in a regular mutual fund. It's a whole different world. Yeah, yeah, the turnover doesn't matter as much in an ETF wrapper. Yeah. Right. So, um, so anyway... Chris, thanks for all that you've done. We'll we'll, we'll come back when we get Daryl back. We're going to have him back in the coming weeks. We got a whole bunch of questions to answer about the uh, other parts of boot camp that we've focused on. Uh, we hope people continue to send us questions. I know we don't get to everyone, but uh, we'll try harder. And thank you for all of you who who uh, keep coming back and and. Uh, Chris, you're a great, a great teacher, and uh, oh, right back at you, Paul. It's fun. You, thank it's you. fun. We're having a good time. Yeah, you got it. Take care, and uh, and everybody have a great week. Thank you.